go. So it started, um, I started three years ago doing the PhD, three years ago, but I've been looking at the photo book for at least six years now. And um, when I was doing my MA, I was very interested in the photo book, and this was in 2012. And, um, and at the time, I was very much, uh, my, my opinion of it was for, in, informed by Martin Parr and Jerry Badger's history of the photo book, which I presume some of you might know, and I will talk about it. But the one thing that um, sort of started the process of the PhD was a question about diversity. And I found this online from last year. Uh, it's the notes on the photo book week here. And the person that wrote it, Katrina Jensen, um, uh, it's highlighted, it says the photo book takes a huge range of varieties these days. And so that's brilliant because that's my problem too, is to understand this variety of what is a photo book. And that's the main question in my thesis. What is a photo book? And a photo book can be many things today. And so I looked at it historically. That's, what, that's how I started. And then it evolved into looking at it throughout several periods and understanding if we could call everything a photo book or not. And then trying to reach present day and look at contemporary production. And I will talk about each section. And, uh, and the, the, the presentation is divided in First, a historical presentation about the history and historiography of the, of the form, and then about the terminology and definition, and then actual, the actual contemporary production. So, rethinking photo book history. Um, so, as I mentioned, you probably know Martin Parr and Jerry Badger's The Photo Book History Volumes. These three volumes have been published uh, in the space of 10 years. So, it's, uh, it has become very, very influential. So the notion of what a photo book is today has been shaped by those three volumes mostly. And the volumes are done, the methodology of the volumes is based on themes. Photo books defined by the photography that is inside them. So if a book was done, it's about war photography, it was allocated to a chapter about war photography. If it's more experimental, or if it belonged to artist books field, uh, and then it would be an artist book in the artist book chapter. Um, whereas the Andrew Roth's The Book of one, 101 Books is more of a chronological history. It, it was the first one to be published. And it's one book per year, roughly. There are a few years that have more than one book. And it tries just to present a chronology of the most important books throughout the 20th century. So these two volumes became extremely important. They shaped not only you know, academic perspective, but also the market. And I would say production, photo book production, and how people perceive the form. Before then, uh, Horacio Fernandez published this book, Fotografia Publica, Photography in Print, 1919-1939, which is a study of, um, it's not a study of the photo book. Uh, people perceive this book as being a photo book history, but it's not. It's about printed matter produced during the interwar period between World War I and World War II. It includes magazines, pamphlets, you name it, that has, is illustrating photographs. And I think it's a, it's a very interesting perspective because it talks about these intersections about several forms of, of printed matter with photographs. And I think that's the way to approach the subject. You can't really talk about the book form on its own and during certain historical periods. So this is a spread from the book. This is a constructivist book. And again, just to show you. This book was important because Martin Barr saw it. And he really liked the way the books have been photographed and displayed. Because you can actually sense the materiality, the physicality of the book. And he thought, oh, OK, I will use this strategy on my volumes. So the three volumes of, of the photo book of history, all the books are represented through this type of illustration. You, it's three-dimensional. You can actually see the books. I think it's one of the keys for the success also of the book, because it really makes you want to go and look for them also. It's a very interesting strategy. And I'm going chronologically back, because there is a, a, a academic production before the, the publication of Roth and Perrin Badger that not many people know about, and uh, that proposed a different uh, way of looking at the history and the, of the photo book and actually try to think critically about the form. So this is 
one of the first, if not the first, study of a specific geographical production of, of photography books. It's a Dutch book. It's called the Dutch Documentary Photo Book after 1945. It was published in 1989. And I think it reaches the 1970s only. Um, and it has this wonderful quote that says, a photo book is an autonomous art form comparable with a piece of sculpture, a play, or a film. The photographs lose their own photographic character as things in themselves and become parts translated into printing ink of a dramatic event called a book. Martin Parr and Jerry Badger use this quote in their volume, the first one in published in 2004, and based their own I, you know, definition of what a photo book is on this actual quote. Um, when I read it the first time, I thought, wow, this is interesting because, so the three volumes of Art Badger, they place photography at the center, as the photographer, as a producer. But this quote actually talks about photography disappearing, and the book becomes the actual core of the, of the production. And this immediately created problems for me. So are we talking about the photo book as a form in itself, as the book, where the photographs somehow become diluted and become part of it, where design is important, photographs are important, you know, the sequence, the narrative, and so on. And this clashed a little bit with what they were saying. And again, the book, this is a spread from the, the Dutch study. It shows books in the same way that um, Aaron Badger did and um, that Horacio Fernandez did too. So although <coughs> the curious thing about this uh, way of showing that is that they selected images from within the book, and they are at the center. And then the, the cover is always on the top, and the spreads are here below. And it's almost like it's a header and a footnote. And so the, the focus is the images inside the book. So in a way, it's thinking about the photo book as a narrative form, but it still goes and looks at the photos individually. And this is uh, also a contradiction of the photo book. It has to deal with this idea of dealing at the same time with a single photograph, the power of a single image, and how it works within a book form where there is a sequence. So, and that's another aspect that this book explores quite well. This study does that quite well. So, and this is from the second half of the, of the study, which selected, I think, around 30 books, 30 Dutch books, that they felt that represented the best examples of Dutch photo book history. Although there are three essays in the beginning of the, the book that uh, this one deals with photographic sequence, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And then you see more spreads. And then you get a sense of the, of the book. So this is Paris Mortel. And you can see it here. It's a Jan van der Koyken book. When you see it here on this side, you really don't grasp the, 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 the beauty of the book, the sequence, all that, because the selection is just those two images, and then the tiny image there. But when you go on to the next page, you can see several spreads, and then you start to understand what you wanted to achieve. So you need to have access to more um, pages, more information. And that's one of the problems with the historiographies of the photo book that have been published so far. They're very selective, obviously, they can only show a few spreads. And uh, it's, it's, uh, you can manipulate the way you show books. You can actually choose the best spreads, and people will look at it and think, oh, this book must be great. And sometimes it's a disappointment. Maybe you get to see the actual book, because when you go through it, it's not really as good as you thought. So I think this is the best way of doing it if you have the space. People share a cigarette. And the, and there are the original of the bride having a cigarette and getting a cigarette to the group. I don't know what's happening there. I think this is the technology that I did where a few years ago. But it doesn't include that. Actually, you can see there is more to it than just it's the, the part of that. And this reproduces the actual cigarette packet. And I will talk a little bit. There are, you know, studies there are specifically about one book that covered from the Americans. The Japanese photo book has been studied. There are other studies about Dutch photo books. And there are other editions there at the end of 2010. That's when I finished this, so after that, so much has been published. And two Danish books have been reprinted by them. It's a very unusual book. And it has a important book also for photography. But it has a sleeve that you pull out. And it's just, it's not going back even further. This is a book that they made a study about photographic and illustrated books. It will be dedicated to 19th century. 
And uh, uh, it's a book that, as well, is illustrated, but it, uh, it's quite a humorous uh, uh, main essay uh, by uh, uh, Lewis, uh, uh, it's called Some of the Extraordinary Things. It's in our living room, it's not been analyzed enough, where he tries to understand the relationship between the work and the book at the beginning of the media, in the early stage of the media. And this is something very interesting. This one is quite rare, but not many people have looked into it, because I think it's in French. And this is a special edition of the UK and dedicated to photographic spaces. So each volume was dedicated to a photographic space, a working space, and this one is about the book. So from 1982. And uh, what I like about it is it has so many things in it that it's text-based mostly. And this is a quote I use with my students when I have to deal with students. Says, the book has a photographic space scares photographers which have to confront a long desert they cannot cross without a guide. So this book wanted to be that, it wanted to be a guide. And uh, I feel that between 1982 and now, not many books have attempted that. It, it's, uh, it's a tall order. You can't really, it's, it comes down to define what a photo book is and what it isn't. And they tried, and they did something wonderful because they divided. Well, they call it, they don't call it a photo book, they call it a photographer's book. And uh, the only explanation I have for that, because it was published in 1982, no one was talking about photo books, but people were talking about artist books. And they found a parallel between the artist book and the photographer. In a way, uh, an artist book was produced by an artist, whereas the photographer's book was produced by a photographer in the sense that photography was at the center. The photographer was making the object in a way. And uh, it, it divides the production between, there is the archive book there, which uh, is basically a monograph. And there are these variations within photo book production that, we, that I will discuss later on. And this is uh, another example of a historian, Beaumont Newhall, uh, engaging the photographer in the book. Most of these studies also, in this, in this particular case, uh, think about the firm also to the evolution of photographic printing. Not only photographs, the chemical process of printing them, but also their relationship with the book and photo mechanical printing. And this is an example, and this book does provide a full history of the photo book since the beginning. Well, it can be, obviously, it's a magazine format publication. This one, and this one, I think it's the most important book in my research. So it's a, it's a catalog that for me published uh, by the California Museum of Photography. By, and the author is Alex Friedman. Alex Friedman is involved with artist books, but he does And um, he published an essay in um, John Lyons' anthology of the artist books in 1980. I won't read this, but it's just showing you. And, um, and he was talking about photo books. But he came up with a term well, called so that's there, like it's photograph of every book to photo book work, form, which is very interesting. Yeah. So I will talk about terminology yeah. later on. Um, and I, I looked at it and said, basically it's trying to differentiate between a photo book from a photo book work. So it's, it's very, very it's fascinating when you encounter a different term, which obviously is attached to a different definition. And, uh, and it sort of makes you question and what's, and books are what's the common perception of what we're doing and thinking about so so this is his book And the book divides the history of photographic publication in book form into talk about four periods. Um, the first one is photographs based in two books, so he's a first century production, where you couldn't print photographs directly as a photographer. Meaning that text and, 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 and images are actually being printed separately. You would print the book, the text, and then you would just glue the photos on. So, you know, manually, so it was time consuming and very expensive. So he doesn't call, he calls them, you know, photographically illustrated books. I would say, well, I chose a, a different term that I will show you later. And then the second section is in photographs. So at the end of the 19th century, with the and development of photographic printing, so it was possible finally what to I print do, photographs uh, you know, as at the same time as text with ink. I feel that it's important. And the second stage, this is in third stage, visual revolution, the 20th century, uh, early 
centuries with constructivists and the avant-garde in France and constructivists in Russia. A different way of thinking about the page. But still not photo books, though. Just to make that very clear. And then, photo books, which somehow ties in with the idea, current idea of what is a photo book. A photo book where a photographic narrative is central, the sequence, the work of the photographer. And he starts with Walter Evans' American Photographs, 1930. So, if you look at current Evans' history, it goes from 19th century, from the early stages of photography, from Max Talbot to the present. So that's what's now the perception of what is a photo book. Whereas people before that try to think about it and try to separate the, the historical you know, development of the form and through different terms and you know, different definitions. So all of this led to the second section of the presentation, rearranging terminology and definitions. I'm not going to talk about terminology. I have an entire chapter about it, uh, around 12. 12,000 words, so it would take a full hour to talk about it. But David Campany, uh, photographic critic and uh, historian, uh, published uh, this article in 2012 dealing with this subject. And uh, he says, uh, the, co the compound noun photo book is a nifty little invention designed to turn an infinite field, books with photographs in them, into something much more definable. What chancer would dare try to coin the term word book to make something coherent of all books with words in them. But here we are. The field needs a name, and until we find a better one, we're stuck with photo book. And he has a point. So literature, we have poetry, we have uh, you know, novels, we have. We don't call them word books, just because they have words in them. With photographic books, uh, obviously, I think he's not right in the sense that we don't call photo books every book that has a photograph in them. But also, we don't define that quite well. So we seem to think you know, that um, every book that has uh, that is being produced now is a photo book because that's the the, the term that we have. Um, you know, it comes from obviously Pyron Badger's uh, photo book history, and it's, um, it's it was a marketing tool apparently to to for the title and to to for the book to be sold under that title. It's brilliant. It's just one word. And it's a, a perfect marketing tool. But when you start looking at it academically, it really doesn't, um, it's not helpful at all. And, uh, and I, I try to look at the, the, the history of the term, actually, photographic book or photo book, trying to find the first instance the English term has been used. And so this is the first article I found from 1942, Elizabeth McCausland. And um, she, this, it's an interesting essay. Um, it talks about production. And she actually argues that photographic books necessarily need to be a combination of text and image. So the essays are very important. Uh, I think we now don't see photo books or photographic books that way. But it's very interesting to see how it evolved. Um, and uh, so yeah, there she talks about various abbots in New York and, and American Exodus uh, by Dorothy Lang. She was involved, I think, in various abbots' books. She wrote. Uh, uh, an introduction, apparently. And so this was the first instance. So the next step was to actually find terminology that I could use to talk about each period. Because I couldn't use the term photo book to describe everything. So uh, taking Alex Sweetman's cue, I also I followed this uh, train of thought. And uh, so I started dividing it by periods. So 19th century to present, I have photographic publications in book form. What this means is that it's a book with photographs, but it can, it's any book. I mean, it can include photo books, artist books, as long as they're illustrated photographs. So this is an umbrella term. And then the second one is a photo book from late 1920s, late 1930s, it depends uh, on uh, the historical perspective that you use to the present. Then the emergence of the artist book in the 1960s, until now. And then something new, artist photo book from 2006 to the present. The term artist photo book um, emerges in Parn Badger's second volume of their photo book history in 2006. Uh, but it's complicated because they try to appropriate artist books 
that had already been um, studied in art historical terms, works like by Ed Roche, Henry Warhol, and they wanted to include them in the study, but because they couldn't call them artist books and, and use a, a term that already had already been defined, so they just appropriated the books and called them something else, artist photo books. So they are still photo books, but they're made by artists, instead of just being books made by artists. So I don't know what the difference is here, it's uh, tricky to know that. But I feel that they, the, this term is perfect to describe books being made now, uh, a part of the contemporary production. And then I will show examples, and we have two books here that can be used for that purpose, actually. In order to also to, to, come, you know, to reach the, the, the terms that um, I've shown you, uh, I've devised a structure of, with characteristics that could help me out, then define those terms and become a solid, you know, critical uh, background for, to sustain the, the terms that I've, I've selected. So, materiality, the physicality of the book, mise en page, which is French for page layout, but it's a technical term, so I use it uh, in, the, in my research, and sequencing and narrative. So these three elements construct the identity of those forms I've shown you, and there are variations, and you'll see how, how that works. So starting with 19th century photographic publications in both forms. So as you can see by this pie chart, it's one of the things we have to do when we do a PhD. We have to translate information into quantitative forms. So it's a strange process, but it works in a way. And as you can see, materiality and, me and page layout, mise en page, you know, take a vast percentage of the, of the chart. And uh, sequencing and narrative are just, it's just a, a, a small, small section. So meaning that in, in 19th century production, Materiality was important because you obviously couldn't print the photographs. You had to produce them separately. So that was already an implications on how you produced the book. Um, and then the page layout was very, very classical, following you know, the tradition of illustration, meaning that images were placed on the right side and text on the left side. So information value was attributed that way, which is still something we do in design terms. People tend to put images on the, on the right and text on the left. And that's how we read also in the, in the Western world, from left to right. So, and that is a, an important part of the, 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 this book form, in particular in the 19th century, but throughout the, the actual development of, of the relationship between book and photographs. So this is an example, Francis Britt, uh, Upper Egypt and Ethiopia from 1863. As you can see, text there on the left, image on the right. And uh, this book, uh, it, it's not side by side. You have the photograph is be, it's on the next page. But what's interesting here is that the text anchors the image. So people would have access to the text first. And the text is explaining what's in the image. And it actually directs the person it, it, toward the reading of that image. Because the author mentions the, you know, draws attention to the, the figure on the left and the hand because the sculpture is, is not complete. So images are anchored by text and that is uh, one of the important characteristics of 19th century production. This will change with time. So materiality, as I said, tipped in photographic prints. So again, photographs and text not printed simultaneously. And importantly, book is a vehicle for the dissemination of text and photographs. And this goes back to my title, the idea of medium and vehicle. And uh, I will explore that throughout the, the presentation. The difference between the book as being a vehicle for something, and therefore, in the traditional sense, you forget what the book is. When you read a novel, we say we read a book, but actually we read the text. It draws you into a world of imagination. So the book has, has been a, is a very stable form, so you don't really question it. It's like a black box. You just open it and you read it. And uh, what matters is the text. It's the information that is printed. It doesn't matter how. It's the quality, obviously, is important for certain books. But in the end, it's about uh, it being a vehicle for that information. In terms of page layout, mise en page, 
again, I, I just mentioned it, that the anchorage effect of the text and how it conditions the reader's understanding of the content and either, yeah, captions or prose text. The 19th century books had captions, all photos had captions. Even if books, some books like um, Dukan's book uh, uh, that, um, you know, documents its trip trip uh, throughout Egypt, there is no introduction, but there are captions. And that immediately places that image you know, somewhere, or describes the, the building or the artifact that you're looking at. There was that need then to explain the image. Images on their own, they wouldn't be understood the same way we, we understand them now, and that, and that would be understood later on. In terms of sequencing and narrative, uh, I feel that it's, it wasn't a primary concern. Single images were prevalent. And uh, yeah, as I say, the sequencing only emerged later on. This leads to a second form. So um, until the end of the 19th century, books were mostly produced the way I described. They couldn't be, photographs couldn't be printed directly, so you would just glue them. So therefore, there weren't that many books illustrated with photographs. They were produced in very small quantities, and they were extremely expensive. So they were not mass produced. And photography was, was circulated through other forms, like daguerreotypes or even craft de visite. So you would have the single image would circulate in society. But not, it, it narrative, you know, sequencing and narrative was not a form that was accessible to people in that sense. Only to people that had money to buy those volumes, those albums. The photo book would change that. So I have two dates there, 1920s, 1930s. Obviously, the photomechanical printing started emerging around the 1890s, and it's a slow evolution of a few decades, mostly because it started also not immediately being used in book form, but by magazines and newspapers, illustrated magazines and newspapers. It would eventually trickle down and, and start, start being influential in bookmaking also. So it changed slightly. Materiality becomes very, very narrow there, that chart. And page layout and sequencing and narrative take over. No, materiality obviously is not important because there's a stability. Because with the introduction of photomechanical printing, there was no need to worry about you know, printing techniques or printing methods. You could do it just simply and add images and text produced simultaneously. It was no longer time consuming. So we come to the division. Uh, this book is there. The seller has one uh, copy, so if you can look through it, if you want to buy it, it's also okay. Um, it's uh, it's Comptes I Photograph. It's a, uh, a classic of, um, of the period of constructivism and how the page was used. Um, although I said that sequencing and narrative are part of the process, not in this period. So that's why I have a problem with saying that 1920s, we could call these books photo books, because it's more about mise en page, and now these artists use the actual page spreads, and this, in this case is a double spread, but it's also, also about the dialogue between left and right, and image image, and not, no longer text image. So text disappears, and images can be on their own, because the relationship with images and how we readers understood that changed. Uh, that through you know, the use of images in press, in the press, so people started becoming more accustomed to that relationship and could read them individually. So this is a wonderful example of, of uh, a page spread that, that uses both sides and tries to convey, in this case, the, the distance and the effort of grabbing that, that, uh, that ball by separating, using the gutter physically to create a a division. This one I also like from uh, Frank Scholl and Jan Fischel's photo line. And how there's a you know a dialogue between the filing and the names and the people at the beach. And how you immediately start making connections about uh, identity and all those names and the possibility of identity of the people that are there and their files somehow. So it's very, very interesting. But it's mostly about this dual relationship, page by page, they construct this idea of, of dialogue. A decade later, and uh, 
and, and that's what uh, Alex Sweetman argues when he talks about photo book works. You have uh, the emergence of photo books where images are on their own completely. And Walker Avent is a perfect example, and his American photographs. It's difficult to say if it's the book that inaugurates that tradition. It is extremely important historically, uh, as a, because it was a, it's a museum object. It was produced by the Museum of Modern Art, and it was the first exhibition at the museum, a solo exhibition of a photographer. And the book became, I mean, no one talks about the exhibition now. Uh, and the book remained a classic, uh, even after 70 something years. Um, the interesting thing about the book is that the captions come after the images. There's a sequence of images, and then you have the captions. So text is relegated to a secondary place. And it's divided into sections. The first section is portraits and some street scenes. And then the second part is just architectural photography. And it's very interesting um, how we created that narrative. Uh, it wasn't common at the time, obviously. So it's a radical book. And the, I, I'm not showing the, uh, the left page, but it's just a page number. So there is no textual information. So I would, I would agree with Sweetman and say this book is pivotal and it does mark the, the beginning of the photo book as a form, where photography as a, is central. It's a photographic book where photos are part of it and the sequence is integral to it. This is a shot from the second part where you see these architectural structures, the book about America. The title is brilliant, it's so, so vague and at the same time just embraces so much. And this would be, a, you know, start here and then goes on for a long time. So, and I thought about bringing things home for you and I, so this is a book by uh, Klaus Clement uh, that he photographed in Lisbon. And I think this is a perfect example of a classic photo book done in 1993, following the tradition of Evans, where uh, although here he, he, he puts two images, uh, you know, on this, the, the page spread, and they, it's incredible, that image over there on the right is uh, scary, I find it so menacing, but it's, it's beautiful. Um, but he does use just a single image in, in the spread also. And it works, and as people are still doing this, it's a way of looking at it. Uh, it's a, a classical format. Uh, I don't say this in a negative way. I think people can do this. It's perfectly fine. And I will talk about this experimentation that we are going through. But you don't have necessarily to do that. You can engage with the book in a classical, in an orthodox way, where the book is the vehicle for the images and the, the narrative. Photographs are really important. And you just focus on the images. So it's, it's like a novel. You, 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 talk, you know, it's the content that matters. It's the photographic content. And the story, and this in this case it was uh, Clemens, uh, you know, several journeys to Portugal after the revolution, and he tried to capture the feeling of the country. It's a very dark book, obviously, because it's Charles Clemens. So these are the characteristics of a photo book. You know, in, in terms of physicality, and materiality, there obviously it emerges after the, the, the development of photomechanical printing. So this step of stabilization of, the, of printing allowed for mass production and a stable form. And it is still the book seen as a vehicle for dissemination of text and photographic images. Although in this case, text doesn't anchor the images so much as it did in the 19th century. So that's the books have introductions, but they seem almost, almost they're paratextual. They are outside that main narrative. So the, at the center is the narrative, the photographic narrative. And an introduction, as in literature, it works as uh, something that is auxiliary. It's uh, like a title. Obviously, you need all those elements. But they are not central elements. They are gravitating around the center. Uh, that is, the, in this case, a uh, photographic series. Page layout, again, repeating the anchorage. And sequencing. And narrative in this it becomes a primary becomes a primary concern. Uh, I write there that it's possibly linked to the emergence of film and montage in magazine essays. I won't have time to talk about it, but uh, film emerges in the late 
19th century, but it develops into early 20th century. And it introduces, um, in terms of narrative, and, and uh, the idea of montage is very important. And uh, film theorists talk about a, it's almost a, a trauma, traumatic experience. This, uh, the time is, is changes uh, in film because when you add, edit different sequences, there is a, a gap of time. So things leap. You know, in time you see a girl uh, hanging in a cliff, and then you see the, the hero on a horse. And that, you know, that juxtaposition for us makes total sense now because you know that there's someone galloping to save her. But it, when it emerged, people didn't understand that. For them it was bizarre because time was a continuum. So having these leaps and, and fracturing time was very strange. I feel that the photo book does that in a way because it can't do time in a filmic sense. Um, and that's something I'm looking at. Um, this, uh, and this idea has been propagated by the, the photo book histories, uh, and particularly by Jerry Badger and Martin Parr, that it's a, the photo book is a filmic form. Um, I'm not entirely sure. It might have links to filmmaking, but obviously it doesn't, it's not able to, to interpret time the same way. So it's more limited in that sense. And in the 1960s, something very important happens to bookmaking and to photography in a way. There's a conceptual term that's important to deal with that also. And when it comes to books, um, in art historical terms, this is the first book, this is considered the first artist book. It's uh, debatable because the experimentation with book form and structural investigation, that's what Joanna Drucker calls it, and I like the term a lot, meaning working with the book form and the physicality of the book and experimenting with that. I'm not showing you any images of this book because it it's what it says on the cover. It's uh, photos of 26 gasoline stations. But for Roche, what's important is the title. He started with the title and that's the cover is almost, it functions like a painting. It's, uh, and that's his perspective at, at the time. Although the photographs now are being sold in auctions as individual prints. Uh, but at the time, what was important was the cover, meaning that this idea of uh, deconstructing what is the experience of the book as a literary form, and as I've said, the photo book is that. It's about opening it and forgetting that it is a book and going through that story that is being told. With the, with the emergence of the artist book, that tends to disappear. And this is a perfect example of that, Annie Worrell's Index, which is a book of tricks and has so many elements to it that this is a pop-up of a, a can, but it has a, a record inside. It came with a balloon that you could inflate. Um, there, is, there are these tabs of, well, they're meant to be acid, but they're a paper that is with color that you would put in water. So you, it's, it's like a children's book. It's the idea of engaging with a children's book, but updating it to adulthood in a way. It has photographs, but they are not the central element of this book. And they are part of the narrative that he was trying to create. And there are many, many examples during this period. And these are the books that Martin Parr and Gary Badger called artist photo books. And I just said that photographs are not at the center. <laughs> so not if photographs are not at the center, it's probably tricky to call them photo books to begin with. And it's book as an art form. So the main characteristics of artist books, structural investigation, as I said, dealing with the book uh, materially, and uh, be, by the acrylic de deconstruction. And I say there, books stop being a vehicle for the dissemination of text and more photographic images and become the work of art itself. In terms of page layout, so images become secondary or they are proportionate elements and layout is still obviously explored. And sequencing and narrative. I say that it's shaped by the book format. I give the exa I don't have images from uh, Michael Snow's book. Uh, Michael Snow is a filmmaker and he did a brilliant book that you, if you read it, you have to engage with the idea of, um, of actually going through a book from left to right. And it's just images. But at a certain point, you flip the book because he, he started he printed photographs upside down. So it forces you physically to change the book. So it's absolutely brilliant. Um, so in a way, it's dealing with that idea of the book being read as a stable form that you go from beginning to end, 
and you don't have to do that, obviously. Although some people, you know, it can work for some projects or not. I will talk about that. The artist photo, uh, 2006 to present. And here you see there's more, it's more democratic. So I've attributed the same space to each element, materiality, page layout, sequencing, and narrative. Although it depends, um, and it applies to the other examples. Sometimes people invest more in their narrative, in the way they construct it, or they invest more on the actual physicality and play with the book form. So it's not 50, 50, or well, in this case, it's not divided. And examples of that, I was trying to think about why people are so interested in now playing with books and trying to engage with the book physically and change it. You can attribute it to books that have become very successful uh, in the last few years. So that's The Afronauts by uh, Christina de Nadal, and this is Christian Patterson's Redhead of Pecklewood. Uh, these books were extraordinarily successful. I think because they are very playful, because they come with inserts. The photographic narrative is important, but it's enhanced by the actual book form and what they did with the books. It plays with also uh, appropriation, photographic appropriation, vernacular photography. So in a way, it's the marriage between the, the photo book tradition that uh, started with Evans, the, uh, the center, the photographs at the center, and then you know the experimentation of artist books and trying to deal with the book as a, uh, an art object. So this is a, a, a hit from this year, Tomasova, Until Death Do Us Part. I don't know if there are copies around. So this, for me, it's a classic case of something that we could call, it's on the verge of being an artist book, actually. But there is uh, an attempt to create a photographic narrative. This is a, a book that it's uh, Chinese photographs. It's um, material that uh, Sova found in China. He, he mines archives, and he, he found discarded negatives, analog negatives, because everything is digital now. And he found them in. Um, they were and then to be destroyed and transformed into the silver. They wanted to extract the silver from the actual negatives. And he just bought them and he started going through them and scanning them. And he found so many images. It's incredible. So, and that's a cigarette package. The actual content of the book is a tradition in China that during weddings, people share cigarettes. And, the, and there's a, a ritual of the bride having cigarettes and giving a cigarette to the groom. I don't know what's happening there. I think he's trying to find the cigarette uh, in. Uh, Somewhere I don't know. So, but it's uh, the actual book is very small. It's the size of a cigarette package. It's um, and uh, it just reproduces the actual cigarette package. So the book comes inside the package and you take it out. And uh, it's foreign meeting content in a way. So it's about that juxtaposition. But it doesn't need to be that radical. So I, this is Paul Gaffney's "We Make the Path by Walking." I, don't, I think the book must be on display somewhere. It's a very traditional book. It has, uh, it's a landscape book of landscape photography, but it has a sleeve that you pull out, and it's just, it's not done in a normal way that you would, it would be inserted or extract from the left to the right. It's, uh, you, you pull it down, and then you have the book. And he, I worked with him on this book, and he, he was talking to a designer about it, of ideas of what to do, because he felt that the book needed something. But he didn't want it to be too gimmicky, and, uh, just something that didn't make sense. And it's a very classical book, and this was a perfect solution. Um, it's a recent example of something that is, I would say, it looks traditional, but then it just it becomes very radical, Paul Gray and a Shimmer Possibility. These are several volumes, but they they have not been sold separately. So he printed each volume separately, but they come together. And because each sequence is, is, has been done individually in each book, one of the books only has one image, for instance. So it's fascinating. And he, he's, it's based on Chekhov's um, short stories. And it's, each book is a short story. So he decided to make one book for each. But you can't buy them separately. So it's fascinating. It comes in a box. A case of appropriation, in this case, taken to a whole new level, the Bible. It's uh, Adam Bloomberg and Oliver Sharon's project, uh, Holy Bible. 
where they highlighted passages of the Bible and then illustrated the, those passages with contemporary images. It's, it's a beautiful book. It's worth very well produced. And it comes from a long tradition because I found 19th century illustrated Bibles with photographs and they're ex exquisite. So it's fascinating to see, you know, in the 21st century, someone still going at it and trying to engage with that idea, which uh, it's obviously as a researcher, you know, I find fascinating because if I call this an artist book, should I go back and change my mind about those particular volumes and say, wow, this is, you know, but they ideologically they are completely different because obviously there were religious uh, motivations, and in this case there are no religious motivations. It's a critique of the actual, the actual thing. And you know, I think this is my last one, uh, Scott Turner's The Pigs. And um, this is um, someone, that, a photographer, a Spanish photographer, that for his project about the crisis in Portugal, Ireland, Greece, and Spain, he decided to appropriate the, the Economist, uh, and he uses that as a template to produce a magazine. And it's absolutely brilliant. So, and in this, it's, uh, I show it to students because it was so cheap to produce, and it's absolutely clever, and it's a way of, and it's no longer a book in a, in a traditional sense. It is a, it can, well, it can be, a, it obviously is a magazine format publication, but because it's not um, periodical, it was just published once, so it basically appropriates the format, and it that for me automatically transforms it into uh, an art object because there is no intent to make it a magazine. So he just uses the the, the formal you know aspects of of the, the Economist to to produce this template. So I don't think you need to go through this, but it's just showing you in a graphic uh, what I just talked about, starting with in the 1840s. What, uh, what I think is clear here is how everything overlaps. Once you have a form, you know, you have 19th century photographic publications in book form, then you have the photo book, then you have the artist book, and then you have artist photo books. And they all are produced simultaneously. So in a way, it's not that one form replaces the other. It's just things are introduced slowly, and they come, and they contaminate, and they influence people. And uh, Tony is going to give a talk at 3 p.m., and his books are perfect examples of what I just talked to you. So this is his book, Pain, and it's uh, a formal approach, and I mean, the colors, everything, black, and you'll talk about it, but it's absolutely brilliant. It's, uh, and this one, the new one, he's going to talk about. So he's a perfect example of a contemporary photographer that marries a tradition as a photographer, a practitioner, uh, dealing with he, his work is very political, but at the same time, he embraces the, the, the experimentation of artist books. So, I don't know if you agree. We'll talk about it, but if these are artist books or photo books, what do you think, you know? I don't know. And it's, <laughs> it's just about people experimenting and doing what they want, obviously. And not, but in the case, if, I think with, when I talk to people, it's more about, uh, and people that want to do books, it's always asking, do you want to do a photo book or do you want to do an artist book? And then they look at me and they don't understand. So I have to go and explain what I define uh, you know, as a photo book and a, an artist book. And I feel that it's important. And why I'm doing this is in hopefully to create some clarity. Uh, probably I'm making it more confusing, I don't know, but um, so people can, in the end, have a tool where they can decide what they want to do. If you're, if sometimes work you know, is more suited to be a photo book in a traditional sense, because I don't think Kraft Clement would want to do something very gimmicky with. You know, like thinking maybe he would. I mean, I don't know, but I think his practice is so more, much more traditional. He's a classical photographer. He wants to talk about specific subjects and the photographs to, to tell the story. Whereas, um, and he's more precious probably about the medium. Whereas photographers now don't really engage with photography the same way. Uh, that's it. So, if you have any questions, if you disagree with me, it's perfectly fine. <laughs> complicate the whole thing but um, <laughs> no, it's not. If, well in, if, in terminology in bookmaking probably it's difficult in another sense no but um, if par if Badger Park appropriate Ed Rouget's book as an artist's photo book yes 
then I, I have great difficulties to put Christina de Middle's Aphronaut in the same category as you seem to do because... No, but, but I, don't, I don't agree with, uh, with what they did because okay. I don't think... I call it those books being called artist, artist photo books is wrong because they are artist books by definition because the tradition and their art historical definition yeah. has been established. Okay. So maybe but, I wasn't clear about but that. Then we do need another definition for um, people like Tony or Christina de Middle who mm -hmm. clearly would think that uh, define themselves as photographers. I mean, Christina de Middle has been a press photographer. Yeah. You have started as a wedding photographer. I mean, I, you, you uh, couldn't be more photographic. So it would be rather a photographer's artist book than an artist photo book. Well, it's just a question of changing the where you put it. Or in this case, a designer's photo book because yeah. it's a uh, no, or a photo book, photo book because it is really this no, this um, triangle between the designer, the photographer, and uh, the material, I mm -hmm. guess. No. Um, but what? Yeah, I, I I agree with you. What, why I use the term is because it's just to root it in tradition and what's been you know established. Because I can't really come up with more new terms. That's already complicated for me to yeah, no, to it, it, to get it, uh, you know, to sort it out with the, the terms. I know it's very complex. Uh, that's the the well, the goal of the the whole thing is to obviously make it clear. And then um, just one footnote to the uh, Chinese book, which is not you know like uh, the the secret packs, the the secret brand. It's called Double Happiness because oh. it shows twice the sign Chinese sign of happiness. So if you put it twice, it's double happiness, and that's it's kind of a wedding cigarette in itself. So they mostly smoke it well, at, 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 yeah. at the uh, weddings yeah. themselves. So it's a really brilliant uh, it is. that yeah. he takes this, you know, the double happiness uh, cigarette pack for that. So, yeah. uh, <coughs> artist books that identify artists themselves is often considered just to be one copy or maybe three or four or five. Uh, mm -hmm. It's very often uh, uh, printing an artist who's open to the same. Yeah. So, uh, I, you know, I think this is a little confusing. Yeah, well, it comes down to the definition of what is an artist book. Yeah, I'm afraid. Book, for me, it's just one book, one copy. There's a long tradition of, yeah. um, of a debate in artist books, uh, in the artist book field of what really, uh, what's the definition of an artist book. So what you're describing is the common perception of what is an artist book, a limited edition that has been done in like few copies. If you look at the literature, an artist book is something that is actually mass produced, like at Roche, mm -hmm. trying. What you're talking about is like book art. It's very specific, like a limited, a deluxe book, where, and the the initial impetus in the 1960s was to make books accessible. Artist books were meant to go outside the museum and be distributed in supermarkets. It was very naive and it didn't work. So, and that's where I'm rooting my, my definition of what is an artist book. But I understand your confusion. And in my research, I do have to explain on top of already the confusion. But, but, but if you go and Google artist book, you, you get millions yeah. of one copy of artist yeah, yeah. Books. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It, yeah. it has become a problem for them to define what an artist book. I think people gave up, basically. So probably I will do the same. I will just stop, try eventually to do that. But you're right, it's already confusing. Yeah. yeah. But, but one could also simply argue that uh, photography has become the core or the mainstream of contemporary art. I mean, simply mm. that I mean, artists do photography today, so why just call it artist books? I mean, I mean have had this uh, to see photography on one side of art and the other side. Yeah. Well, I, I feel that you're right. There is no distinction. The problem that I face with my research is that the way the photo book is seen is something done by photographers. And there's been a division. Uh, can I give you an example, actually? I went to New York last year to the New York Arts, uh, Artist Book Fair. And there were photo book makers from Europe there. And the photo book scene is very intense in Europe, but not in the United States. So they were just a small section in a huge fair in the, in the museum. And there, they would be part of the whole production of bookmaking. So these definitions, obviously, I think they are silly because I do them because I'm doing a PhD. But I feel that you can call them whatever you want, as long as they're good, fantastic. Um, 
and you know you engage with the object. It doesn't because it doesn't matter if you're a photographer, if you're an artist. I mean, if I asked Tony, do you define yourself as a photographer or as an artist? I'm already making you know an assumption, and so I feel that these books are, you know, they can belong in several spaces, and that's why I said just because I define them, you know, certain aspects that might uh, create an identity for them. It really doesn't mean that people might just go outside that, that specific uh, characteristics and use more one thing than the other. It's a choice, it's a choice people make. And the same applies, yeah, to, to other forms, uh, art, artistic forms, I guess. How people use video or whatever, it doesn't matter anymore. Yeah, thank you. Are you considering publishing your PhD as a Book, book, or a textbook, <laughs> or a book? I don't know if you want to read it, uh, e book. Um, I, uh, I think it would make probably more sense to make it more available online. I don't know, that's a good, uh, in academia, that's a, a discussion how to make things available. I couldn't, for instance, do it probably, I would have to do it physically because everything has to be peer reviewed, has to go through a certain process. So. Mm -hmm. I could not put it just online, online and say, probably not. And just because of restrictions in academia. But if I could, I would do that. I would just make it more available. I like the idea of discussion, people being able to contribute because it's very isolated. So this is brilliant, so people can think a little bit. There's a question down there. Yeah. So, oh, sorry. Can I? It's okay. Should I? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Well, first of all, thank you for uh, sharing everything. I think this has changed my view of, on, on photo books forever. <laughs> so thank you for the, that. Um, so through the whole talk, I, I thought, hmm, well, there have been so many different kinds of photo books, or books with images. And so does the book uh, with images then have a future? Like uh, with, with social media and all that? Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think so. That's one of the concerns these days. Is the book dead? Mm. Isn't it? Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think it's dead. I think it might. It will become uh, even more of an art form. I feel that. Um, it has to do. It. It will. You know. I. I would say that mass publication will probably. Uh, you know, become more digital, and e-books and all those things. But people are still very interested in having the object. And for artists and photographers, that makes sense because currently it's the way to promote your work and it's the way to show it. Sometimes, you know, books become the, the actual work and how they do the pro the final project is the book. So I think, no, for it will probably be a niche, very, very specific. And that's sustainable. It, it'll probably be very expensive. <laughs> but and so. It becomes a market. It becomes rarefied. It will be, be it will be different. I would say, um, as a literary form, it's a good question. I maybe not. I, mean, I read everything on, on my iPad. So, but photo books is not not many people have tried. So maybe that's the next step. But that that's an ongoing discussion on how to do it. You know, online or how to and with social media, it's a good question how to translate all that the immediacy and all that. So, you can do it probably. <laughs> if you're thinking about it, yeah. hopefully. hopefully. Well, maybe, to, maybe to that point, um, I mean, we just recently saw a, a resurging of the LP. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the real LP that you, that you used to be before the CD. So now that it's, it's become a big market again. So I don't think that the, the book itself, as a no. form, will disappear. Yeah. Um, it'll be a bit in a niche in the background, but then they'll still, it'll, it'll always be, because there will be people who want to have the yeah. experience of opening a book, looking at whatever form it may be. Um, it's true, yeah. <coughs> the analogy is, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, I've thought about it, and music, um, the music industry also changed a lot, so and probably it's a good example of something that we should look at and see how it evolved. I'm not sure if with book publication, if we will have, because it's so complex to produce, you know. It has to do with technology also, if it disappears. And that, in film for instance, that's an, it's an intense debate about digital film and analog film. Analog film has disappeared, basically. Because film theaters, for instance, have dumped all the equipment. <coughs> 
So you really can't reproduce a film set for, you know, and they're going in an analog format now. Mm -hmm. So either you convert them to digital copies, or you have to go to the last place that has a projector. And that's a, an interesting discussion. I don't know if with photo book making, I think there's still a tradition of small print printers. And so if that is sustained, then it will be possible to to continue. And with inkjet printing, because now everything is done so quickly with one machine. And the quality is amazing. So I agree with you. It will probably remain. But as I said, it will be a niche. It will become very small and very, you know, um, just uh, for a select few in a small community that will do it. Yeah. And then there's a market for monographs and all those things. I didn't talk about that, but you can do actually really good things with mass-produced books. I'm, I'm talking about more self-published or artistic variations, <coughs> but a museum catalog can be absolutely brilliant if it's well done, can be very inventive. I have nothing against monographs, for instance. I think they serve a purpose. For me, I, everything should be out there. Um, but obviously the discussion is centered on that. And yeah, LPs are a good example of how there's a renaissance of that. As there is a renaissance of photo books in a way. Of you can also say that uh, photography never killed painting. Sorry? You can also say that photography never killed painting. You could. <laughs> you could. I just wanted to add one word to the, uh, to the you know, what, what we were saying about photo books or artist books or whatever, you know, as a pr practitioner. Um, at least in my experience from, from, from my work, I never really approach any you know, publishing process or any project that says, do I want to make an artist book or do I want to make a photo book or do I want... I just have a piece of work mm -hmm. that I want to bring in a book form. Yeah. Um, so for me, the actual terminology is quite irrelevant. Yeah. Um, I think it's more of a market perspective because markets need labels. Mm -hmm. And so there is, you know, in order to be able to market it in any shape or form, you need to have, well, yours is an artist book, but hers is a, is, a, is a photo book, and then we can place it in a market in a different way, attribute some value to it. Whereas I think for, for me as a practitioner, I have a story, and I, you know, I, I, as a photographer, I always embrace and love the, the book form because for me that's the way to how I want to, you know, um, publish or uh, express my projects. Mm -hmm. um, but it's for me, I try to get to the core of what you know the project is about, and then find the right form mm -hmm. to publish it. Yep. And whether that's in a in a in a in a very, you know, gimmicky way or just a one image per page. Mm -hmm. That'll just depend on the story. Of course. Yeah. That would be a very nice uh, way to uh, end here and uh, leave there these the threads one. for. Um, can, I, can I just add one more? Hold on. Uh, um, just finish my sentence. Um, and uh, leave the thread for our next talk, which you will be part of. Um, because we are half an hour over. But if there's no, maybe one I'll last leave. question, then uh, no. we'll, we'll do it now. But it's always great to evaluate a, an event by you know, how many open questions there are still left when the talks are over. So by that, uh, it's already a great success for us. Uh, but do finish your sentence, and then uh, um, we can maybe... No, I think uh, I'll leave it for the round table. Okay. Because it's a very long sentence. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, thank you for your first sentence that we'll hear in, uh, in more or less half an hour's time. Thank, thank you very much. much. Great.